Hello, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Dr. Ken Berry, family physician, and hopefully if all goes well, technically, I'm going to be having an enlightening discussion with my good friend, Dr. Nadir Ali, who is a board certified practicing interventional cardiologist who practices in the Houston, Texas area. I'm waiting for Dr. Ali to join the live stream now. If you know someone who has been considering a low carb keto carnivore diet and uh, they've been considering, but they're afraid to go keto or low carb or carnivore because they're afraid that it will raise their cholesterol or their, their LDL cholesterol, then please send them a text message right now. Call them on the phone, yell out the kitchen window and tell them to tune into this live broadcast because that's exactly what we're going to be talking about is if having an elevated total cholesterol, does that truly increase your risk of having a heart attack or a stroke? What's more important, an elevated LDL cholesterol or a very elevated HDL cholesterol? Which one's more protective? Which one's more dangerous? So while I'm waiting for Dr. Ali to join us, please tell me in the comments where you're watching from, what city, what state, what country. Say hi from wherever in the world you are. As always, you're welcome to share this video. You can share it on a Facebook page in a group. You can share it on your Twitter, Instagram, Vero, TikTok, Gab. I don't care where you share it, but the more you share this video, the more people that you help me to help. There is a proper human diet that human beings can eat and optimize their health. Every other diet is less than optimal and leads to leads slowly but inevitably towards chronic disease, suffering, inflammation, pain, and misery. So please help me help the world understand that there is a spectrum of a proper human diet that you can eat for optimal health. And then there's pseudo food, Franken food, junk food, standard American diet that you can eat for chronic disease, fatigue, mental fog, and failure, disaster. So we're waiting for Dr. Ali to join. If you have a question, please go ahead and, and type it in the, the comments. Let me see if I've got a reply from Dr. Ali yet. Yep, he should have the email. He should be joining us any minute now. All right, hello. Cypress, Texas on YouTube. Hello, St. John in Canada. How's it going, guys? Uh, this is going to be an exciting conversation. As I said earlier, Dr. Nadir Ali is an interventional cardiologist. He is actively practicing cardiology in the Houston, Texas area in the United States. He is a, a preeminent thinker when it comes to all things low-carb, keto, carnivore, he is going to set your mind at ease. Let's see. Where are you, doctor? Oh, he, he's having to download Firefox because you can't use Safari with the um, software package that I'm using here. So it'll be just another minute and then he'll be joining. Hello, Dubois. Hello, it's probably Du Bois there. Hi, California. Hey, from the UK, Andrew, good to see you here. Burleson, Texas, I love it. Martine says hi from Ireland. Ah, oh, there's Dr. Dr. There you are, Dr. So, volume button. He's, get, he's still getting set up. We'll, we'll give him a second to get set up and get all his audio and video going. Cedartown, Georgia. Hey, Terry Bell Sneed. Burleson, Texas. Manor, Texas. I don't know, guys. I feel like Texas is winning. Where are my California people and my Tennessee people and my New York people? Are you guys, are you guys quarantined from the TV as well? Scott says he lost 200 pounds on keto, now carnivore. That's what I'm talking about. That's the kind of health transformation you can have by eating the proper 
human diet. Now, like I said earlier, if you missed this, if you have a relative who has prediabetes, diabetes, heart disease, fatty liver, uh, any of the chronic metabolic syndrome diseases, please go get them by the hair of the head. That's what we grab people by here in Tennessee, the hair of the head, not just by the hair, but by the hair of the head and drag them in front of a television or a computer monitor or a cell phone screen and make them watch this video. This is going to help them more than anything else they could probably hear, read, or watch today. Let's see if doctor's ready. Doctor, are you ready for me now? <laughs> he knows about cardiology and he knows about keto, but audio visual, you know, we'll give him another second. We'll give him another second. Hey, Elise from Kentucky. How's it going? Who else we got with us here? Grace Lake, Illinois. I love it. Oh, Tracy says that she's down 116 pounds and off all medications. So if you've just come to Keto Carnivore Low Carbon, you're hearing these stories, you're like, this has got to be snake oil, right? That can't be right. That a, a diet can't. I mean, a diet might help you lose weight, but it's not going to help you come off medication and reverse chronic diseases that your doctor said were progressive, right? Yeah, it will. Just stay tuned and listen. All right. Dr. Ali. Let me send him a message here. I can see and hear you, Mama. Can you hear me? Question mark. Hey, Ken. Doctor, are you there? I cannot hear you, Ken. I'm sorry. I don't know what I'm doing wrong here. Mm. We may have to we may have to work around that. Um, I am not able to hear. So, let's see. Can you hear me? Uh, say a few things. Let me see if yeah. I can. Oh, I can, I can, I can hear, hear you fine. Hear, but I don't know I why I can't yeah. hear you. What am I doing wrong on my machine? <laughs> Maybe it's a Mac. Turn, oh, it's a Mac. That's the problem right there. Who loves Macs? Everybody's got a PC, right? I just made my wife mad. Don't get mad, Nisha. Just kidding about the Mac thing. He'll figure it out. He's a smart guy. What is it? What is it? <laughs> We're going to get this figured out. Don't worry, guys. Mic is muted. Share screen. Apples, I know, right? Share screen, okay. All right. What the hell is What about now, doctor? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Oh, now I can. I don't know what happened. Uh, good, good, good. Okay. You may have to off the headphones, and that way we won't, we don't get because we're getting feedback. Oh, that's better now. Perfect. Okay. Can you hear me now? Um, uh, yeah, I can hear you well and clear. Uh, yeah. Let me uh, get some headphones if that's okay with you. So it'll just take me a second to get the headphones. Very so I'm going to leave this on, go get some headphones. Okay. We'll see if there's another question or two that I can take. <laughs> Apple is not keto friendly. I don't know. Sometimes I wonder, right? Kitty says, what are your thoughts on nitric oxide? Kitty, nitric oxide is very important for proper vascular function in your entire body. And if you're eating uh, on the spectrum of the proper human diet, your body's going to produce all the nitric oxide that, that all your, your vessels need. Yeah, exactly. Nisha loves it. If you guys don't know, I've just popped up Nisha. She's my, my lovely wife, my manager, my assistant, and my boss. Go follow her channel. See her? I just popped her comment up there. There you go, Nisha. There's your free plug. Don't say I didn't give you some love. Brenda Zorn says, hello, Dr. Barry. Dr. Ali is my buddy. Fasting is a superpower. I fasted 10 of his patients at Low Carb Houston. Yeah, fasting, if done properly, is a superpower as far as health optimization goes.
John says, how can I increase white blood cell count? Well, John, you don't want to increase it too much. You want it to have, you want your white blood cell count to be within the normal range. Uh, if you're eating lots of fatty meat and a little bit of veg, your body is going to make all the white blood cells that you need, your bone marrow is. Now, if your testosterone is very, very low, then your bone marrow may not be able to do its job of producing blood cells, including white blood cells. So if you're having trouble keeping your white blood cell count up, go see your doctor and have them check your total, your free and total testosterone level and a sex hormone binding globulin level. And that may be the that may be the hidden piece of the puzzle. All right, doctor, can you hear me now with your headphones? Are you there? What about now, doctor? Can you hear me? I'm uh, turning on. I'm trying to connect my headphones. Right. I can hear you, but I can. I'm trying to connect the headphones. Okay, sounds great. Yeah, Michelle, for anybody watching right now, there will be a replay of this on both YouTube and on Facebook. We're live on both right now, but both of them will save a copy. If you want to come back and watch this again later and take notes, it will be there waiting for you. Debbie Dyke says, my heart calcium score was 700. Should I get on keto and stay there? 100% yes. Can you hear me through the, uh, yep. okay, great, excellent. I, I guess I'm connected. All right. All right. I'm sorry of, for all these technical difficulties. No worries, no worries. Yeah, this is the first time we are doing it, so yeah. get yourself, awesome. I can get see yourself, you well in here. Get yourself centered up in the video and say hello. We've got about 1,700 people watching right now. Wow. You got quite a presence. There so, we go. Uh, hello there we go. there, everybody. I am honored to be here with Ken, my good friend, and I've learned a lot from him. Uh, I am ready to go. I have uh, all the enthusiasm for this uh, face uh, live broadcast, live webinar. I love it. I love it. Doc, uh, it's such a pleasure to talk to you again. We've met a couple of times in person, and uh, this is a guy that if you're around him, you just want to give him a hug. He is such a sweetheart of a guy. He's a lovely human, and he's also wicked smart. And so I'm going to let him introduce himself and tell us a little about him so that you'll know why you should listen to him, why you should care what he has to say. Doctor, tell us about yourself. So I have been a cardiologist roughly 30 years. Uh, I spent uh, the first 24 years of those almost exclusively in the cardiac cath lab, I uh, feel like, I, I don't want to brag, but I feel like I had this gift of doing stents and opening up people's blood vessels very nicely. And I was quite disillusioned about being in the office. I did not want to be in the office because I would tell my colleagues that I'm completely ineffective in the office. I don't do anything that makes a difference Reducing their cholesterol doesn't make a difference. I cannot treat their blood pressure effectively. Their diabetes is getting worse. They're getting obese. And my light bulb moment came in 2012 and 2013, like I have told people before, uh, I'm a cyclist and I belong to a racing team. I was the team doctor for them and uh, when I wanted to get down from about 180 pounds to about 160 pounds, I could not do it. And uh, in that year, Chris Froome, who is a Tour de France cyclist, he's won a Tour de France uh, a number of times. Uh, I heard that he was a low carb uh, cyclist. And so I said, let me explore this a little bit. And when I started exploring that, I said, why didn't I learn about this in medical school? And when I learned it on my own, I said, let me try it. And within three months, I was down to about 160 pounds. And as you see me today, uh, six years later, I'm about a little over 140 pounds, about 142 or something like that. And so I said, if this works so easily in me, why should I not try this in my patients? Why should I shun myself away from the office? Why should I feel so 
so much like an abject failure as a physician. And then when I started trying that, I found that my 80 year olds, my 90 year olds, my 70 year olds were losing anywhere from 30 to 50 pounds when they put their heart and soul into it. And even not like, you know, it's not like it was very difficult for them. And when I saw them losing that much weight and coming off their diabetic medications, their blood pressure medicines, their cholesterol quality improving, them stopping their statins after we had a discussion about the degree of benefit, the degree of risks and seeing how they felt without it. Um, I just could not contain my enthusiasm. And then I started trying to find like-minded people like Ken Berry, going to the conferences, meeting with people, learning more and more about this. And as you know, when you network with people, uh, they share their experiences with you. You learn from talking to patients. You learn from talking to N is equal to one experimenters who do all kinds of testing on themselves. So this has been an amazing journey for me. Yeah, same and for me. And my story is very similar. I used to be morbidly obese and pre-diabetic. And the diet that I finally discovered that, that reversed those things for me how could I not share that diet with my, my patients? It worked so well for me. It would be, I would be remiss if I didn't say, Hey, this is what worked for me. Uh, you should try it. But I'll, I'll, I want to disagree with you on one thing, doctor. You said that you didn't learn about this in medical school, but it's my opinion that in our first two years of medical school, when we're taking physiology and we're taking biochemistry, we do learn about all of this stuff. And actually, if you'll go pull out your old physiology textbook from med school, it's all in there. The fatty acid cycles, the Krebs cycle, it's all there. But, but then we had it indoctrinated out of us in the third and fourth year of medical school. And then all through our residency and fellowship, we had that, that basic science that we had learned in cell and molecular biology, physiology, biochemistry. We had that science, that meaningful science. We forgot about it because we were so busy learning the propaganda of the drug reps and, and the stint reps that we forgot our basic science. And I think that's the true for most doctors and other healthcare providers. If they'll just go back and pull out their physiology textbook from the first year, look at it. It's all in there. If you eat too much fructose, you're going to get a fatty liver. If you eat too much glucose, your blood sugar goes up, your insulin goes up, your inflammation. I mean, it's all in there. But then we get it all beat out of us in the, in the next seven years of our training. Now, doctor, you are a practicing cardiologist. And so there are so many people watching right now who are scared to death of keto or low carb or the carnivore diet because either their primary care physician or their cardiologist said, if you eat low carb keto carnivore, you will have a heart attack and die. You're a cardiologist. How do you disagree with their doctor and give us your logic for disagreeing? Uh, I could not disagree with doctors more about uh, low carb and keto in terms of improving people's health. And um, I'm glancing at the number of comments out there. And, you know, some of them were uh, taking my attention that some of one of the person has familial hypocholesterolemia which is a family history uh, which predisposes somebody to having very high LDL levels, which is called the bad cholesterol. We'll put that on the shelf for now, but kind of answer a more general question. And the general question is that when you go on a low carb diet, uh, it invariably improves you from these standpoints. Number one, it reduces your insulin level. Number two, it improves your cholesterol quality. So we want to emphasize cholesterol quality. And cholesterol quality is when your triglycerides are low and your HDL is high. HDL, people call as the good cholesterol. I, I don't think we should call LDL as the bad cholesterol, and we'll get, that, uh, get to that in a minute. So these two things are happening when you're doing a low-carb diet. In addition, 
you notice that your blood pressure is improving. In addition, you notice that your hemoglobin A1C and your blood sugars are improving. In addition, you notice that your inflammation markers are getting better. And in addition, you notice that you are losing weight. So a number of factors are happening that are making you feel better and you are biochemically improving. So the only thing that your physician is scared about is that your LDL, which is they call as the bad cholesterol, I refuse to call it the bad cholesterol. Now that is going up and I have to disagree vehemently with my colleagues that the increase in LDL cholesterol in that situation is bad. I think in that situation, it's actually good. The reason it is good is because you cannot compare somebody with high sugar levels, high insulin levels, high triglyceride levels, who also has an LDL cholesterol that is a little bit above guidelines as a person who is following a low carb diet and has improved so dramatically in so many biomarkers <clears throat> in their blood pressure as well as in their weight. So um, I want Ken to chime in here and then if uh, uh, there is a moment we can kind of talk about a new study that has come out that puts the myth that LDL cholesterol is bad even further away from the truth. Yes. So what I'm hearing you say, and I'm going to, I'm going to repeat what I think I heard you say, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but so when we're, when we talk about someone eating a low carb keto or carnivore diet, what we're going to see in their lab work, we're going to see invariably, I, I, I don't know of a single exception, their triglyceride level is going to decrease. It's going to come down. Their HDL, which a lot of people call good cholesterol, is going to go up. Their LDL, which some people call bad cholesterol, I call it the other good cholesterol, and I think Nadir is going to tell us about a study momentarily that's going to help shore that up. Your LDL may go up, it may stay the same, or it may go down on keto. Uh, it's different for different people. Your total cholesterol, it may go up, on keto, it may stay the same on keto or it may go down on keto. Those two numbers don't really matter, but the triglycerides and the HDL are very, very important. And then two other numbers that you really want to focus on, like he said earlier, if a patient has chronically high sugar levels, it's, it's irrelevant what their LDL is because all the damage is being done by the high sugar and the high insulin. So I'm really, really focused on trying to get people's hemoglobin A1C back down to normal. Even if it's a little bit elevated, that's doing daily permanent microscopic damage all over your body. And then the final marker that I really focus on is a C-peptide level, which is a surrogate marker for how much insulin your pancreas is having to produce to keep your blood sugar low. And so to sum up, keto low-carb carnivore is gonna keep your A1C and your C-peptide in the very low normal range, which is wonderful. It's going to keep your HDL high, your triglycerides low. It may or may not raise your total cholesterol and or your LDL, but we really don't care about those numbers. Uh, you may have seen some of Dave Feldman's research that shows that having a higher total cholesterol level may actually help you live longer. So that's why less and less are, are knowledgeable doctors are even concerned about your total cholesterol. We really don't care unless it's really low, and then that's actually worrisome. Do you agree with all that, doctor? No, oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, what I was going to allude to is that there are a, there is a lot of information that high levels of LDL cholesterol are actually uh, beneficial in terms of survival, which means how long you're going to live, uh, a lower risks of cancer mortality, a lower risk of lung infections. Older people tend to die of lung infections. And this is borne out in several population-based studies. So there is a study out of Europe, out of Netherlands, in which they took 50,000 patients and they followed them for 10 years. So it's not a small study. This is 50,000 patients. And 
what they found out, especially in women, was that higher your LDL cholesterol, lower the mortality, all-cause mortality. In men, it was also pretty similar, except that it was not as dramatic as it was for women. Now let's take a new study that got published in the British Medical Journal recently. And they took patients who were coming to the hospital having a heart attack. And they divided them into a group that had low LDL cholesterol and high LDL cholesterol. And then they followed them for a number of years. So which group do you think had a higher risk of dying? The people with the low LDL cholesterol, which is supposed to protect them, or the people with the high LDL cholesterol? So no surprises here. It was people with the high LDL cholesterol who had a significantly higher risk Sorry, the people with a low LDL cholesterol had a significantly higher risk of dying compared to the people with the high LDL cholesterol that doctors are trying to wipe off of this planet. Let me tell you another uh, finding in that study. And that finding was what is called heart failure. Heart failure is a situation in which there is damage to the heart muscle invariably from a heart attack. The pumping capacity of the heart is reduced. So these are people who have damaged heart muscle from a previous heart attack. And in this study, they compared people with low LDL cholesterol compared to people with high LDL cholesterol. So here is a low and here is a high. And the people with high LDL cholesterol, which people are, which doctors are trying to reduce, actually uh, survive better. So in other words, having a high LDL cholesterol was a marker of better health and longer survival. <clears throat> so whenever a physician puts a person on a cholesterol reducing medicine or is having a discussion about high cholesterol, they should always talk about cholesterol quality as the number one aspect. The number two aspect they should talk about is several population-based studies that show that high cholesterol is associated with a better outcome. And number three, if they want to put somebody on a cholesterol reducing medicine, they should always talk about the degree of benefit and the degree of risk somebody takes when they start on that medicine. And they should be made aware of the possible side effects so that the person can be vigilant about whether this medicine is causing harm and they are able to make an informed decision because many people in their 30s and 40s and 50s who are getting started on this medication will be on this medicine for 30 to 60 years. And an important decision of whether you want to use or not use this medicine should be a significant discussion with the patient. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's a discussion that very, very often does not happen. <clears throat> I can remember back in 2001, two, three, even 2004, when I would be trying to put somebody on a statin because their LDL was high. Back before, when I was an ignorant doctor and didn't know any better, I would not go into great detail about the side effects because I knew that if I didn't have a high enough percentage of my patients on statins, that I could actually be deemed by the insurance company. I could actually get a lower rate of reimbursement and get fewer bonuses from uh, the health insurance companies who I had partnered with, right? And a lot of doctors are, are very acutely aware of that. Uh, people think that, you know, doctors just make money hand over fist. Uh, basically, we do make more money than the average person, but just take your bills and add a zero. And that's the bills of the average doctor. And so we've got a lot of bills to pay, a lot of overhead, a lot of payroll, and so we've got to get those bonuses from the insurance company. And if I had went into detail with my patients back then about all of the, the probable side effects, not just possible side effects of taking a statin, if I'd have said, you're probably going to have some muscle aches, you're going to have some joint stiffness, you, you may notice that you're mentally fatigued and, and cloudy, you can't think straight, your memory's not going to be as good, uh, this statin's going to lower your testosterone. 
This statin is going to raise your blood sugar a little bit. If I had told my patients all of that back then, I would have had maybe one patient out of 100 that would have actually taken the statin. And so, so many doctors, they feel beholden to the health insurance companies and they've forgotten the oath that they took a long time ago to first, first, first do no harm. And so they wind up doing harm, but it's just a little bit of harm. And, and plus, I'm going to get this big bonus check from the insurance company every quarter or twice a year, or once a year. And I need that to pay the bills. And I, I don't want to have to let a, an employee go. And that's the kind of thinking that goes on behind the scenes at a doctor's office in a, inside of a doctor's brain. All healthcare providers have these conversations with themselves. But you got to remember, doctors, you got to remember that oath you took. Did you mean that? Or were you just kidding around? Did you go into medicine to truly help improve people's health? Or did you go into to medicine to improve your bottom line? That's really what you got to ask yourself at the end of the day. Really, I'd rather you ask yourself that at the beginning of the day so that you can get off to a good start. But yeah, I used to do the same thing, doctor, and I would neglect to tell every, all the potential side effects of the statin because I was trying to get everybody to take them because I knew that my performance data was based on that. Now, I had a question earlier. I want to ask you this, and this, may, this question may make you uncomfortable, doctor. Are you ready? Yes, absolutely. Okay. This person said, you know, the, the big pharma companies that sell statins, they, they've been researching this for decades. They've been researching the effects of statins on all this stuff because they have, they have accountants and they have risk calculators. The person said to me, don't you think they know? Don't you think they know that statins don't really help at all at this point? Don't you think that if there were some big class action lawsuit and that demanded them to do a document dump of all of their studies they've never published and all of the research data that they have, don't you think Big Pharma already knows that the statins don't help anybody and, and, and have an ungodly amount of side effects? Do you believe they know that at the, at the top levels of the Big Pharma companies right now? So I'd like to phrase it or paraphrase it a little differently. Bias makes us ignore important information. And bias makes us design clinical trials and do things in such a way in which you can convince yourself that what you're doing is the right thing for people. And the way the bias is created uh, in big pharma is that they say, we have so many checks and balances in the system and consequently our data is right. And I would beg to differ in that because 95% of all clinical trials that have been done with statins have been done by the pharmaceutical industry. And the pharmaceutical industry is paying everybody to do the trial. It's paying the doctor at the clinical center. It's paying the hospital where it's being done. They pay a team of experts who they hire to analyze the data from all the different centers. They pay a safety monitoring committee to make sure that patients are not being harmed. But in other words, that safety monitoring committee is getting money from the big pharma. They pay the FDA to approve new drugs. A substantial portion of the FDA's budget comes from the uh, pharmaceutical company contributing to the evaluation of new drugs. They pay the big medical journals like American Heart Journal, the, uh, uh, the New England Journal of Medicine, the American Medical Journal, because when a blockbuster study comes out that is going to make a lot of money for the pharmaceutical industry, they order millions of reprints at very high cost that they go and distribute to everyone. In addition, the, they have lots of advertisements in the journal. They pay the medical associations because a substantial portion of the budget of the medical association comes from contribution by big pharma, then at the end, when the drug gets approved, they pay people like me, they say, Dr. Ali, you are a big opinion leader in the community. If you say that this blockbuster drug is helpful in preventing heart attacks, people will believe it and prescribe it. And by the way, here is about 
two and a half to three thousand dollars will give you about five nights a month and you go out and tell your colleagues that this is a good drug and what happens is that if you go to propublica.com and put in dollars for doctors <clears throat> you will see that physicians are making between a hundred to five hundred thousand dollars some of them not all of them by talking for the pharmaceutical companies for people to use this drug so in other words the pharmaceutical company is paying everybody who is going to make a decision in this process and the person that suffers is the patient because there's nobody who is really looking after his interests in an objective way without bias science also suffers in addition they feel that the pharmaceutical companies think that they have done enough checks and balances so when a third party comes in like the cochrane collaboration or somebody else who says look give me the raw data give me the raw data i want to analyze it myself i want to make sure that uh what whether this data is valid whether that it is robust that is not shared by the pharmaceutical industry that's right so many people don't realize that so this dr ali is absolutely right the big drug companies, when they do a research study, they consider that research to be proprietary information protected by their, their patents and their trademarks and their copyrights, and they will not share the raw data. And so that's why this person, this person was kind of somebody in the know, and they, they were asking a very leading and knowing question because they probably already know the answer to it. But the point was, they already they've already figured this out that statins are worthless and that they're probably actually damaging people but they damage people so slow that you don't die today or tomorrow so therefore nobody's going to be able to sue anybody they think but yeah the, the doctor's absolutely right you we do not have even as doctors we do not have access to the raw data that was that was crunched to give us the results that show that there might be a, a one or two percent absolute risk reduction we don't get access to the data. All we get is what they say the results were. And in my opinion, that's scientific malpractice. What do you think about that, Doc? Well, oh, I could not agree with you more, but we could take it even a little further. And the way I would take it further is to say, okay, what is the best clinical evidence that a drug like statin is beneficial? And in order to go at the best study, like the blockbuster study that they would claim is showing unequivocally that this is really good, you have to go back to 1994 and look at the forest trial. The forest trial was done in Scandinavia, little over 4,000 patients. These patients already had evidence of heart disease. They either had a heart attack or had stents or evidence of heart disease. So these are high risk population. So you take 4,000 of these patients. Now, mind you that this study is done completely by Merck. They had the clinical monitors, they had the biostatisticians, they analyzed all the data. Most likely they even wrote out the journal article that got published mm -hmm. because they hire a team of ghostwriters. But you say, okay, these people at Merck are honest people that they will give out the right information and we're going to take their word that this study is accurate and if you take a look at that what happened is that it over five year period if you look at the most important endpoint which is reduction in the rate of death over five years the reduction in the rate was uh, reduction in the rate of death was about three percent 3% is 0.6% per year. What that translates to is that if you treated 200 patients for one year, you will reduce one death. 99% of patients taking that drug will have no reduction in mortality despite taking that drug for one year. So the reason I'm putting this out is that the degree of benefit 
in the best clinical trial that was completely done under the guidance of the pharmaceutical industry provided a very small benefit. Now, the pharmaceutical company would like to exaggerate the degree of benefit. They don't report it as a 0.6% reduction in mortality per year if you treated 100 patients. They say over, a f and, and I'm not sure about the exact number, but they say over a five-year period, there was a 42% reduction in mortality, a 42% reduction in mortality. So what an ordinary person thinks is that, by God, it will reduce my chances. If 100 people took it, it will reduce the chances of dying by half. But that is complete deception. And I have used Dr. Malcolm Kendrick's uh, uh, talking point about this. And since you have so many people who are on this webinar, I'd like to kind of paraphrase his words. Yes, please. It's like saying uh, the Tennessee lotto is... Uh, one in 15 million, you have a chance of one in 15 million of hitting the jackpot. And I come in and tell you that I'm going to increase your chances of winning this by 50%. So you would think that's a huge increase in the chances of you winning, but actually the increase is from one in 15 million to 1.5 in 15 million. In absolute terms, that is zero followed by six zeros, three. But in relative terms, if I want to sell a drug, I would say, hey, there is a 50% reduction in mortality. Right. And that is the kind of deception, the statistical deception that people are, that the, the drug companies are using, that unfortunately the doctors are also doing the same. Now, you take that and then you move on to 2004 and find that there was something called the Vioxx trial that was done by Merck, the same company that did the 4S trial. And what you find is that in the Vioxx trial, the Merck company withheld important information from the FDA that the Vioxx drug was making the blood a little thick and was causing an increased risk of heart attacks they manipulated and tampered the data. There was a whistleblower at the FDA that said, I want to bring this to light and his information, they put pressure on him to suppress it. When all of this came to fruition, when all of this came to light, 88,000 patients had had a heart attack and 40,000 patients died in the period that Biox was sold that was attributed to the drug. Merck paid $5 billion. And that was the first time that the US Congress came with the recommendation that whenever you do a study, you have to publish it. Before that, a company could do 10 different studies, suppress the nine that showed their drug not in favorable light and publish the one that showed in favorable light. And since then, clinical trial after cl clinical trial shows an enormous 25 up to 60% reduction in LDL cholesterol. And the degree of mortality benefit is becoming smaller and smaller or non-existent. So if you say that lowering cholesterol is helpful, and you reduced cholesterol by 25% in the 4S trial. And in a new clinical study of similar patients, you reduce it by 60%. You should say that, hey, this should improve your mortality further. But that evidence is not there at all. Right. Right. Absolutely. Excellent point, doctor. Excellent point. Let's see a couple of other questions. So, if you had to sum up, so we've all been told high total cholesterol, that's dangerous and bad. High LDLC, that's dangerous and bad. But in your opinion, what are the biggest risk factors? And that's what everybody cares about is what's going to cause me to have a heart attack? What's going to cause me to have a stroke? What's going to cause me to block up my arteries? 
what are the numbers that we should be looking for? What are the foods that we should be eating? What tests should we ask our doctor for if they are not ordering them? Uh, so, so what are the true risk factors for CAD or CHD that we can actually talk about and understand? Yeah, and that's a, such a nice segue because we want to talk about things that matter and yeah. we want to move the subject away from LDL because that's such a minor player in my mind. The most important aspect for people to look for is insulin resistance. And if you would permit me, I have had a new paradigm, a, a, a completely new revelation in my mind, a light bulb movement that showed me what insulin resistance is. And I don't know if you've been following my Twitter feed or looked at my presentation at Low Carb Denver, but I'd like to take a moment to talk about a paradigm shift that I have had because I used to think about insulin resistance in completely the wrong way. So that my paradigm, paradigm shift moment came about by having a metaphor and the metaphor may not be the best one, but it illustrates the point quite well. So if you take a person who is hooked to opioid drugs, morphine and other drugs, the first time that they take the opioid, they get a bang up uh, pain uh, relief, they get euphoria. But as they keep taking opioid drugs more and more often, they need to take a higher dose to get the same pain relief. The reason that's happening is because opioid receptors, so the opioid drug works through opioid receptors in the brain, and these opioid receptors get down-regulated. There are fewer number of these receptors to which the opioid drug can bind. And I did not know until recently that insulin receptor behaves the same way. So you have insulin that is elaborated by the pancreas, and insulin goes and sits on the insulin receptor. And when insulin sits on the insulin receptor, it makes uh, it activates the insulin receptor so that the cell can take in sugar, so that the cell can activate its machinery to make new protein. There, our brain is very rich in insulin receptors. So when the insulin sits on the insulin receptor in the brain, it activates a series of chemical reactions that make your brain form uh, tighter connections between neighboring brain cells. So this is called synaptic plasticity. When you connect better with the neighboring brain cell, you have better memory, you have better cognition. So the insulin receptor is doing a lot of good things for you, except that in a standard American diet and the way we do things, we are eating constantly several times in a day. We are eating a lot of carbohydrate rich food. So you create repeated and frequent hyperinsulinemia. In other words, you're making your pancreas release insulin more and more often. Yes. When that happens, it down regulates the number of insulin receptors in your brain it down regulates the number of insulin receptors in the rest of your body, including in the pancreas, which is sensing sugars to release insulin. And what happens is that your brain and your body get starved of fuel because insulin in large ways is necessary to drive fuel into the cell so that it can function. So people, who are eating constantly, they have down-regulated the insulin receptor. The functions of the insulin receptor is gone. The cells are energy starved and they <clears throat> feel constantly hungry. The brain is energy starved. So an uh, important point to mention out here is that the rate of dementia in our country is skyrocketing as we get older. And the primary reason for dementia is insulin resistance in the brain. When your brain becomes insulin resistant, it down regulates insulin receptors 
it is energy starved it doesn't have enough energy it cannot protect itself that's why the brain goes through atrophy that's why the connections between the brain cells get destroyed and that is the reason why people get demented if we were to able to reduce insulin resistance which you are doing by doing what you do the low carb diet the fasting the carnivore you are doing more good for people than mainstream medicine is doing yeah i totally agree okay. and so, so to sum up, up if, if you want to improve it, if you if want to lose fat if you want to increase your risk or fatty liver or kidney failure heart failure liver failure then you've got to eat fewer carbohydrates than the guidelines recommend the the food pyramid the handout that your doctor gave you about a diet is going to tell you to eat anywhere from 150 to 300 grams of carbohydrates a day if you do that you're going to have continuous blood sugar spikes during the day which is dangerous and inflammatory but that in turn is going to keep your insulin level chronically high which is also dangerous and inflammatory as well it's going to down regulate the insulin receptors on your cells membrane, both in your brain and the rest of your body, which is going to make you insulin resistant. So you've got this very high blood sugar, you've got this very high insulin, and you've got insulin resistance at the cell membrane. That is a setup for chronic disease, obesity, suffering, inflammation, and early death. That's what that is. And so regardless of where you fall on the proper human diet spectrum, if you want to be an ovo lacto pescatarian, as long as you keep your total carbohydrate intake somewhere between 20 and 50 total grams a day, you're going to lower your blood sugar and that's going to lower your insulin and that's going to upregulate your insulin receptors on the cell membrane of all your cells. That is the way you reverse type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetes or hyperglycemia or insulin resistance or fatty liver. That is the way you reduce your risk of dementia. That's how you do that. And you, you can call it low carb. You can call it keto. You can call it carnivore. You can call it one day next Thursday for all I care, just as long as you eat fewer carbohydrates. It's my opinion, doctor, that human beings are by definition low carbohydrate, salty mammals. We, we, we don't need to eat too many carbohydrates. It's intoxicating and dangerous and habit forming, but we also need plenty of salt. Uh, someone wanted to know, is there a place where they can find a link to the research that you talked about? So I think that the best uh, place where people can view most of my work is on YouTube. So if you go to YouTube and you put my name, uh, Nadir Ali, uh, and put an MD, or just put Nadir Ali, you'll get about 55, 60 of my videos. And um, that is the best way I have learned how to communicate the information that I'm trying to give out to patients. Um, I try for this to be a public service. I try not to tell you, hey, uh, come to my office and see me in my office or do an online consult with me. All of those things are possible, but that's not, why I am doing this. I have enough patients that come to me. I, I don't need to see more patients. Um, I need to spread this message and feel like I'm doing something relevant that is improving the health of not only our country, but the rest of the world. And I want to join in a movement like Ken Berry is and be part of that movement and do whatever small contribution I can. So in short, just go to my YouTube channel, put my name in, and look at all my talks. Excellent. And I'm gonna I'm gonna have Nisha put your links in the show notes on Facebook and YouTube so people can just click on them and and because your videos are excellent. This guy's been giving free community lectures for years now in his community there in Texas. And uh, he he's such a giver and a lover of humanity. How can you not love Dr. Nadir Ali? Doc, somebody asked me if they're convinced that the statin's not helping them, do they have to wean down a statin to stop it or just stop it and throw it in the damn garbage? I don't think anybody knows the answer yet, but uh, in my clinical experience, I have stopped statins in a number of patients without tapering them. 
and I have not seen any adverse effects. So um, you are a little uncomfortable, taper them down, but I think that stopping them suddenly is also okay. Yeah. Um, always uh, communicate with your physician. I'm trying not to give you individual medical advice. That's right. Uh, because uh, I don't know your particular situation. Exactly. Uh, and and I'm, I'm a little more mouthy than Dr. Ali, so I'll just tell you, there is a place for statin, and it's in the garbage can. <laughs> Dr. Ali, we're coming up on the hour. Thank you so very much for doing this. Guys, if, if you don't know about Dr. Ali, you've got to check out his YouTube channel. He's got amazing videos there. Uh, Dr. Ali needs to write a book, don't you, Dr. Ali? Yeah, I have actually, um, uh, I used to be, and, and I'm very good in the cardiac cath lab still. And uh, what I have done is that I have stopped working in the cardiac cath lab. I have a very good colleague who is much younger, who's very good at doing these procedures. So I've given the procedures to him. I'm in, I'm in the process of putting all my thoughts on cholesterol, on insulin resistance, on ApoE4 together and trying to come up with a book. It's a daunting task, as you know, you have written a book yourself and you have revised it. So yes. um, I wish that I could tell my patients, I want to stop practicing now and just be uh, Ken Berry 2 or <laughs> I guess Ken Berry 100. <laughs> nobody can come close to you. Uh, thank you, doctor. Thank you. Well, you're changing the world with your community lectures and with your YouTube videos and with the work that you're doing. You travel all over the world speaking at conferences, trying to help people understand what is the proper human diet? What should you eat and what should you avoid? What medications actually help you and which medications just help Big Pharma make another billion dollars? And so I want to thank you and applaud you for the work you're doing. And I know I'm not ever going to stop and I don't think you're ever going to stop either. So we're going to be around for a while. You guys follow Dr. Ali, subscribe to his YouTube channel and click that little bell. So every time he posts a new video, you don't miss it. And you can do the same for my channel if you'd like. Any parting words, doctor? Uh, I just want to tell that people don't realize the power of fasting and the power of nutrition which is so much more uh, in terms of magnitude of effect as to how much better you can get compared to what can happen with medicines. And unfortunately, all of medical profession is designed to give you one pill after the other when you go to their office. And I think you need the people, what you are doing is a grassroots movement. Yes. You, know, you need to get your people who are following you to go to their physicians and start this conversation saying that, hey, I am not interested in pills. Is there a way in which you can monitor my blood work, give me advice, or if you cannot give me advice, can you see what I am doing and help me see whether my blood work is improving, help me get rid of many of these medications? So the change in medical profession is not going to come top down. It's That's going right. to come from bottom up. It's going to come from people like Ken Berry and people who follow him, who then go and have this conversation with their physicians, which is meaningful, which is transformative. Because that's when, if a physician is, hears from you, that you've lost 30 pounds, that your blood sugars has gotten better, that you feel better, he better get transformed. Yeah, and when he hears it from one patient, he may just laugh it off. When he hears it from the 10th patient, he'll say, that's weird. But when he hears it from the 100th patient, or there's some number where he'll go, what the hell is this keto business I keep hearing about? Your doctor's gonna go home and Google it, and then you just change the doctor's mind. And when you do that, You've just helped all the other thousand patients that that doctor takes care of. You didn't just help yourself. You didn't just help the doctor. You helped your entire community to be healthier just by having that one conversation with your doctor. Because you never know if you're the first patient or if you're the 10th or if you're the, the final patient 
that makes the doctor say, damn it, I've got to go research this ketogenic thing. I don't know, but it seems like it's working for all these people. Doctor, amazing, amazing. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, we'd love to have you back on anytime you've got a free moment. I know you're busy doing all your stuff, but this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Ken. I hope to see you soon. Yes, yeah, see you next time. Take care, brother.